Welcome back. We're looking at part two, chapter six here. In chapter six, part one, we left off talking about the first stage of the replication cycle, which is adsorption. So we talked about how adsorption is related to the host range and how this involves the virus actually attaching to the host cell. In part two here, we're going to pick up where we left off and continue with the uh, additional stages in the replication cycle. So the next stage in the replication cycle involves what's called the penetration stage and that is immediately followed by unconing. So it goes adsorption, penetration, uncoating, followed by synthesis, assembly, and release. But at this slide I'm actually kind of combining the, the next two stages in one because they really happen kind of simultaneously right after each other. Not simultaneously but in a, an immediate sequence following each other. So they're, they're kind of in the same, almost the same um, breath if you will. So when it comes to getting inside the cell, we call this penetration. And let's just take a quick look at a figure I pulled up off the web here. This is showing the HIV virus uh, and the overall cycle as a whole here. So here it shows HIV attaching. It shows then HIV starting to come in the cell, which is the penetration stage. So in this case, we're looking at how the virus is kind of fusing with the cell. And the envelope here, this is an envelope virus, is actually going to merge with the membrane of the cell and the two are going to kind of fuse together and that's actually going to release the capsid held inside the envelope. It's going to release the capsid into the cell here. And then we'll, we'll look at the, uh, the next stage. Actually right after that right here is showed the uncoating stage. So, so we're showing penetration and then uncoating is actually the breakdown of the capsid releasing the viral nucleic acids. In this case it is an RNA virus. Here's another figure showing a very similar, slightly different process so another envelope virus is being uh, engulfed by the cell and actually wrapped in a membrane as it comes inside. So it's actually coated, so it shows here a coated vesicle, and then that coating has to then be released, which involves the release of the capsid, which then releases the RNA, in this case an RNA virus again, after it's uncoating. So there are two slightly different variations of this, but in both cases the virus is attaching, being brought into the cell, and then releasing the capsid in the RNA or DNA nucleic acids into the cell. That then transitions into the synthesis followed by assembly. So the two mechanisms that we were looking at there, one is called endocytosis and the other is called fusion of the cell membrane. Let me go back here just to point out which is which. In these figures here, here we're looking at endocytosis. Endocytosis is actually a lot like phagocytosis. If you remember back in chapter four, we talked about how white blood cells swallow little bacteria. Well, there's a similar process in which the cell is actually swallowing the virus. In this case, it's actually letting the virus in the front door inadvertently, but it's actually a very similar process. So call it endocytosis, it's being swallowed up. And in this one, it's uh, you're seeing fusion of the cell membrane, fusion of the membrane. Uh, so uh, fusion of the envelope. So what you're seeing is the envelope here literally fusing with the cell here. And they've kind of just shown it as kind of already partially began, but that's what's happening here. The, the two are literally fusing together. So that's, uh, those, that's the two mechanisms there. Endocytosis and fusion of the cell membrane. Here's a figure out of the textbook showing the similar we're showing the same things in a similar way. Here we're seeing endocytosis, the virus is attaching, and the cell is literally engulfing the virus and then coating it in the separate vesicle here. After that, the virus has to break down the vesicle, release the DNA, or this, in this case it's a DNA virus, has to break down the vesicle and the capsid, which involves the uncoating step. Every virus is a little different, so we're kind of generalizing here and we're not going to get into how this virus works and how that virus works. So we're kind of showing a broad, we're kind of painting this with a broad brush, I should say, a broad stroke. So uh, every, every particular virus has a slightly different variation of this, but that's kind of the gist of it, being engulfed and then breaking that down, which involves uncoating. So really uncoating, just to clarify, involves removing any sort of surrounding that's covering up the DNA or the RNA. And in this case, that happens to be the vesicle, as well as the capsid all simultaneously to release that DNA. Here we're seeing fusion of the membrane. What happens here is the envelope fuses and the capsid is released free of the envelope right into the cell. 
So as the virus comes in, it's losing its envelope. And then the capsid breaks down, and in this case, it's showing RNA. RNA is released uh, into the cell. So those are the two mechanisms there. <clears throat> I'm not going to uh, have you write an essay about this, but I will have you, most likely I'll show an image of this here, one of these two. I'll ask you which is being shown, so be able to recognize it from this figure here, and also uh, recognize the description of each and what's happening. Now, synthesis follows immediately after the uncoding stage. And in a sense, this involves the virus converting the DNA or its RNA into viral protein, as well as replication of the DNA or the RNA. So there's a lot here, and being a kind of a in, only an introduction to the viruses, this, this part, as well as the assembly, we're going to keep very brief. So all I really want you to know here is that there's really two things happening. One is the DNA or the RNA, depending on what kind of virus it is. Remember, there's, there's DNA viruses and there's RNA viruses, and, and they're one or the other. So if it's a DNA virus, then the DNA is being replicated, and if it's an RNA virus, the RNA is being replicated. It does this by using the host cell's own replication enzymes. And what ends up happening is the, the, the virus basically hijacks that machinery to make its own copies in, in, a, in a case where normally that machinery, quote unquote, will be used to copy the, the cell's own DNA. So it's kind of hijacking DNA and RNA replication machinery to use for viral purposes. So that's one thing. The other thing is that, that the, uh, the information in the DNA or the RNA, remember DNA and RNA contains information for how to make protein, that is then being converted into viral proteins. So if you refer back to the central dogma diagram I, I gave in, in the part one, it shows how DNA is converted into protein. In this case, the virus is making its own protein, which largely make up the capsid, and that will go on to uh, help create a new virus. Okay. Um, the next stage is the assembly. Assembly essentially involves the formation of the capsid, which involves individual capsomers. So another topic from Chapter 6, Part 1, remember that capsomers are the building blocks of the capsid. And the way these work is that the capsomers will literally spontaneously form to create a capsid. Here's a, a figure showing some of the, the individual capsomers of an icosahedron virus. So what they're showing here is how the, all these here are individual capsomers and how these can all form into, this is kind of a top-down view of an icosahedron ca capsid. Not real obvious from this picture here, but that's what that's attempting to show. So here are individual capsomers. What this is trying to show is how they have a geometry that literally allows them to spontaneously form this capsid, in this case, a cosahedron. So whether that makes full sense or not, I'm not sure. What you really need to know here is that the assembly involves formation of the capsid through the spontaneous assembly of the capsomers. So really, the protein mostly makes up the capsid. Okay, so that, that takes place somewhat spontaneously, and that then allows the virus to begin the formation uh, into a mature virus, which will follow by the last stage, which is the release. What you're looking at here, this is a real microscope image of an infected cell that contains thousands and thousands of small little viral particles. So this, at one point, was the nucleus of the cell. It's been largely distorted, and the cell is being destroyed from the inside out. And the reason I show this figure is because I want to em emphasize that the assembly is not a perfect process. So when I say the virus capsomers spontaneously arrange into viral capsids, as it says here in the second paragraph, this is an imperfect process. There's a lot of trial and error, so to speak, and a lot of, um, a lot of capsids that don't form, or a lot of capsomers that don't fully form a capsid. So what you're looking at here is a lot of waste left behind from capsids that didn't fully form or capsomers that didn't actually manifest into a capsid. These little black dots here, these are actually fully formed or, or I should say partially formed viral particles. So these are actually getting closer to full formation. Whereas what you're looking at here is a lot of debris left behind that never actually made it into the full formation of the capsid. So what ends up happening is the virus churns out millions of individual capsomer units and some of those will spontaneously form into a capsid and many of them will just be left as debris that never actually fully formed. So it's a very imperfect process. And ultimately what the virus is doing is playing a numbers game. If it, sh if it puts out enough particles 
eventually some of those will form a virus and, and that's all that really matters whether the percentage is is one percent or 0.1 percent as long as it ends up forming a couple viruses that can exit the cell and go on to to infect a new cell then it's successful and that's kind of what you're looking at here is all of the waste left behind from viral particles that didn't actually form in, in uh, a small handful here that actually have so that's kind of the assembly in a nutshell there so Synthesis, making the protein, copying the DNA and the RNA, assembly, spontaneous formation of that, and then the last stage involves uh, some of the release here. In fact, one more slide here is actually showing another part of the assembly for the envelope viruses. One of the things that happens with the envelope is that the envelope, if you remember from chapter six, part one, envelope actually comes from the host cell that's being infected. So in order for that to work, what has to happen is once the capsid is formed, as this, this here is showing the, the capsid, also referred to as the nucleocapsid. Capsid lines itself next to the membrane of the host, along with some of the viral proteins that are also assembled into the membrane. So part of the envelope involves creating the spikes that get laid down in the cell membrane, as well as the capsid attaching to those spikes on the bottom side of the envelope. And then in the next stage, we're going to see how this actually buds outward and pinches out becoming a new uh, viral envelope. So in the envelope you have an extra step in which the uh, viral, viral capsid attaches to the membrane which is going to be pinched off to become the envelope. Okay so that's where it leads into the next stage which is the release. So when it comes to the, the actual final step in the cycle releasing the mature viruses there's essentially two ways that this can happen. For envelope viruses they, they always exit through what's called exocytosis, or what's also referred to as budding. And just to clarify, exocytosis is the exact opposite, essentially, of endocytosis, this word here, which is what you're looking at in this stage here, endocytosis. So exocytosis is, in this sense, as I just mentioned, the capsid is assembled along with the viral spikes here. All of this is part of the assembly stage and they're being laid down in the cell envelope. The capsid attaches on the bottom side and then the release involves the virus being pushed outward and the envelope being sealed or formed around that virus. So once again, the envelope actually comes from the host membrane. That's what you're looking at here. Viral spikes get incorporated during assembly and the release involves pinching that off and sealing that around the viral capsid to now become a fully formed envelope virus. So that's called exocytosis. Now this is exclusively how envelope viruses release. And this is how they get their envelope. They get it from the host cell during the release stage. Naked viruses and complex viruses like bacteriophages, they release through a different process called lysis of the host cell. Lysis is a term that involves rupturing, popping, splitting, bursting. There's a lot of different ways that you can kind of describe that, but essentially it means to rupture or to pop open. And in this case, you're seeing here, this is actually a real microscope image. What you're looking at is what's left of a cell that's been popped open during the release stage of a virus. Uh, here's another figure, I'll come right back to that slide. Here's another figure showing, this, this is an, an illustration, but showing the same thing. Here's a host cell that's being lysed open and these little complex bacteriophage viruses are all bursting out. Uh, another one here, not as obvious, but this cell is being ruptured as the bacteriophage viruses release as well. So essentially they can bud out with their envelope or naked and complex viruses, they just pop the cell open and they release that way. So this is a few more notes about exocytosis, unique to envelope viruses as I mentioned. Uh, capsid attaches into the spikes embedded in the membrane and then pinches outward. And this is what creates the viral envelope. And that is essentially where the envelope comes from, from the host cell membrane during the release process. Lysis bursting open, particles are destroyed and the host cell, excuse me, particles are released and the host cell is destroyed. What we're going to get into next is some of the damage that is caused by viruses. But just to show, a, give you kind of a little heads up on one of the things I'm going to mention here. 
as it's obvious from this this picture here, during a lysis release, the host cell is going to be destroyed. And this says right here. So lysis clearly involves the destruction of the host cell upon release. And so it's fairly obvious that that's going to damage the host cell. This is one of the things that causes damage when a virus infects a living thing. The release stage involves the destruction of the cell in this particular example. The truth, however, is exocytosis in the budding also causes damage in a slightly different way, maybe not quite as obvious. Here's another two figures showing the lysis here and then budding. What budding does, the damage from budding comes from a slow depletion of the host cell membrane. So every time the virus exits, every time a single virus exits, it takes a little piece of the membrane with it. And the next virus takes a little bit more of the membrane, and then a little more, and then every time a virus exits, a little bit more of the host cell membrane is being taken with it. Now, in many cases, a virus, a single virus can enter the cell. One virus comes in, and it can literally make up to a million copies of itself. It may only be 10,000, it could be 100,000, it could be up to a million. Uh, again, different viruses, different rates of replication. But the idea is every time a little piece of the membrane gets taken with it, and so if, if, if the virus just keeps taking little pieces and little pieces upon exiting, what eventually happens is the host cell membrane just starts to collapse and deteriorate literally from within. And that is another way that viruses cause damage. It's just by depleting the membrane, by taking little bits and bits and bits and bits. It's not as obvious as the lysis, which is one big boom and pops it open, but it can be equally damaging and, 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 and in some cases worse depending on the context. I mean, really both are bad, so to say it's, I shouldn't say it's worse, but it can be equally as bad, um, although not nearly as obvious. So this here is showing a close-up view of, uh, this is a real microscope image showing viruses exiting here through exocytosis. Over here, this image is, is, is showing some of the damage that's caused to the membrane. The membrane here should be nice and smooth, have a nice kind of round curvature to it. And instead, we see a lot, a lot of these, almost like a crater-like shape, almost like a rocky surface. And that is a result of, of the viral release from the cell. That is not what we should be seeing. We should be seeing a nice, smooth context of that. So you can kind of see in this figure, although it's probably not really obvious, you can see some of this damage caused by the virus here on this rough surface. It's very, very abnormal. I've got some more figures here I'll show you. Let me, uh, let me just skip ahead. I'll come right back. Here's another figure showing the same thing. This is a uh, lung tissue, and this, these are your alveolar sacs here where your oxygen exchange and CO2 exchange, CO2 exchange takes place. And these are real nice and large, lots of surface area here. There's the, the cell tissue around that. And so this is normal lung tissue. Viral infection, in this case, has led to the exocytosis, and the, and the cells just start to deplete and crumble in and get smaller and distorted. And what that's done here is it's created less and less air space, or less and less alveolar space, surface area, I should say, where oxygen exchange can take place. So you're kind of seeing here the kind of inward crumbling of these cells as a result of exocytosis. So you can kind of see that fairly well in this picture. Normal lung tissue, viral infected tissue. This was, comes from what's called the RSV virus. Okay, so we'll come back to that one here in a second. So that's where we're kind of starting into the damage to the host cell. So essentially, damage comes from a, a variety of things. Uh, as I just mentioned, exiting is, is one of the most obvious. Either popping the cell or depleting the membrane can both cause damage. The truth is not every virus causes the same amount of damage. Some viruses are virtually harmless and some viruses are extremely deadly. And the difference often comes down to the rate of replication and the rate of release. That's one of the biggest factors that determines the damage a virus will cause. There are certainly other factors, but is a very kind of general consistent part of that is the rate of replication and the rate of release. If a virus replicates very slowly and releases very slowly, especially if it is a, uh, um, an exocytosis process or an envelope virus that's budding out, then it's, it's possible that the, the virus could replicate and release so slowly that the cell can actually repair itself during that release phase. So it's, it's possible that damage can be very minimal if the replication and the release is slow. If that replication is very fast and rapid, then the damage outpaces any kind of form of repair. So that's a really fact, really big factor in the, the difference of, of damage. Um, one of the most deadly viruses of all time 
was the 1918 influenza virus, sometimes called the Spanish flu. It was actually a, a flu virus, just like the same flu that goes around each year here in the U.S. and around the world. I shouldn't say just like it, but it was actually the same strain. It was an influenza, just like influenza A and B that people pick up almost yearly. The difference with that, and the reason why it was so deadly, was that it killed, or the reason it killed, it was so deadly, was because of the fast replication rates. It was one of the fastest known replicating viruses, and it, it literally replicated so fast, it would just outpace people's immune system. Normally, your immune system suppresses a virus faster than the virus replicates. And there's kind of this game, when you start to get infected, there's kind of this chess match between the virus and your immune system. And the, you know, 99.99% of the time, the immune system wins. This is far superior to most viruses. Most viruses just don't have a chance against a healthy immune system. It's just not even a fair match. Every once in a while, you get a virus that is a superior match to our immune system. And there's, you know, not everybody's immune system is the same. There's different genetics, and they've actually shown that people who died from that virus had a slightly different immune system. I wouldn't say it was inferior, but the virus actually kind of had an advantage. Uh, based on your genetic component. And so the idea is that in that particular case, it replicated so fast that in a lot of people, their immune system just couldn't keep up. And that was the difference between life and death, unfortunately, for them. Okay, now, release is a big factor. Some viruses go dormant. They don't all go directly into synthesis and assembly right away. So sometimes they go from the absorption to the penetration and uncoating and then go dormant before they go right into synthesis and then assembly. So the, the, the rate of, of progression through each step is not equal. The release is not equal. And all of these things are factors in how damaging that the virus can basically be. Some of the terms that they use to apply in the discussion of viral damage, one is called a, a cytopathic effect. Cytopathic effect. CPEs is the, the acronym for that. And a CPE is a term that refers to any sort of damage that can be seen with a microscope, a basic light microscope, so a very simple microscope to refer to. So while you can't see viruses with a microscope, I mentioned that back in part one, viruses are too small to be seen with even a, a, a general microscope. They're, they're just way too small. You would need a very, very high power resolution, high power, it's called an electron microscope to see viruses, which is not something that you would find in a doctor's office not something you would find even in a, in a basic college in most cases. So very, very advanced microscopy to see a virus, which is where we get some of the images I've shown you. But what you can see is you can see the damage that they leave behind after they, they uh, are replicating. So that's what this term is replying, uh, uh, referring to. So some of the damage would include things like disorientation of the cells. They can literally start to become uh, rearranged, start to look out of, out of uh, sequence with each other. Shell, cell shape, they can you know, see a size and the shape. The cells can become distorted. Can I mention is the membrane can become depleted. It can change uh, shape and size. And even inside the cell, you can see some of the damage that results from the synthesis and the assembly. And what ends up happening there is the normal cell metabolism basically just gets shut down in order to make more virus. The virus basically just turns off the normal cell metabolism and uses all of that machinery, quote unquote, to make more viruses. So a lot of the intracellular changes result from a shift in normal metabolism into viral metabolism. One of the terms that they usually apply to the intracellular changes are called inclusion bodies. And inclusion bodies in this case are in reference to some of the mass of viral particles that you see inside of the cell. This also can refer to some of the damaged cellular organelles that can also result. So cytopathic, cytopathic effects, a very broad term, referencing any visual induced damage to the to the cells that you can see with the microscope. Inclusion bodies are a specific example of little masses of, of viral particles left after viral replication. Another example of a, a CPE, a common one, is called syncytia. Uh, sometimes I'm never quite sure how to pronounce some of these. Syncytia, I've heard it pronounced both ways. Syncytia, syncytia. Uh, syncytia, I'll say syncytia is a scenario where you've got exocytosis taking place. And uh, it's also a scenario where the you've got tissue with cells stacked up next to each other. So you've got lots of cells right on top of each other. Exocytosis takes place. 
and causes two cells right next to each other to kind of fuse together as the membranes start to break down because of the exocytosis the membranes literally just kind of fuse together and start to mangle the shape into some sort of very very unusual disorienting look and that's called syncytia here's a figure showing what that would look like in the wake of an infection this is right out of the textbook kind of hard to show to see what the normal would look like I guess here's a normal cell and over here so here's one particular cell and over here they're showing the result of this syncytia in which you've got all these cells kind of fused together in one big chunk and the most obvious telltale sign of that are where you see multiple nuclei all fused together so if you look over here this nuclei is surrounded by its own cell membrane here's another normal cell here you can kind of see it's got its own boundary and, and each cell kind of has its own special membrane as it normally would. Over here, you've got a big chunk of cells that have all been fused together as the membranes kind of uh, melt or fuse together as a result of this exocytosis. So this directly results from exocytosis in which cells are right next to each other and they fuse together. Um, one particular virus that's especially common in, in young children called RSV stands for respiratory syncytia virus. This is named for the effect that it actually has. So this is what's actually happening in the lung tissue of an infected individual. Adults can get this virus, but the immune system as an, of an adult is usually competent enough to suppress the virus before it ever becomes an issue. So it's usually more of an issue in young children who don't yet have a fully competent immune system. And this is that figure I was showing you earlier, and the uh, effect here can be seen uh, where these cells kind of fuse together and create this larger disorientated mass that no longer looks uh, correct in reference to the normal lung tissue here. Okay, so that's a, a, a bit about the damage there. Now, next to here we're going to talk about the, the way some viruses can essentially go dormant into a cell. As I mentioned, not all viruses go immediately into the synthesis and assembly and release following the penetration and encoding. What ends up happening in some cases is they can incorporate into the DNA of the host cell or just remain latent in the cytoplasm. So in some cases the DNA of the virus just sits there and in some cases it actually integrates into the host cell. Let me pull up a pic picture or figure of that real quick. Here's a figure, once again, of HIV. HIV does this. It shows the virus coming in, uncoding, releases the, the, in this case, it's actually an RNA virus. RNA is converted into DNA. And then what, so that's shown here in red. This is now in the DNA form. And what's happening here is that the, the, the DNA of the virus is now literally inserted directly into the host chromosome. So this here, this big X looking thing, that's representing the host DNA. And this is human DNA. And so someone infected has the virus come in, convert itself into DNA, and then that DNA, the viral DNA, is, is in, in, injected, so to speak, and incorporated directly into the host genome. What's amazing about this is that the host cell can't actually tell the difference between its own DNA and the virus DNA. There's actually no physical differences between the molecules of viral DNA human DNA or any other DNA. All DNA molecules look the same. They don't have any sort of identification markers like cells do. And your immune system or your cells cannot tell the difference. So once DNA is inserted, it just becomes synonymous with the rest of the DNA. And it's a real problem because now the body can't necessarily identify its own DNA from foreign DNA. There are sometimes other ways to determine that a cell is infected, but as far as the DNA goes, that becomes now part of the rest of the cell's DNA. So this is what we call a provirus. When viral DNA is incorporated into that of its host cell, that is referred to as a provirus. Uh, this can lead to the DNA being copied. So when cells go through mitosis and meiosis and copy the DNA and, and, and make replicates of those cells, that the viral DNA is copied right along with the rest of the host cell DNA. Again, this, the host cell can't tell the difference. So it ends up passing along the viral information onto its daughter cells, and then those cells can make copies and pass it on further. So the, the, the virus now literally gets a free ride and is copied by the host cells into future generations of new cells. 
and this is what we refer to as a persistent infection. Uh, now, the, again, the host cell can, and sometimes, in some cases, be recognized by the immune system. There are little ways that the immune system has adapted to flag itself that indicates that the cell is infected by a virus. So, so your body can, in some cases, get rid of those, but it's much more difficult because once the DNA is incorporated, you now have to basically just destroy the entire cell, which is what a lot of times happens anyway. But these viruses are particularly good at kind of hiding from the immune system, keeping their DNA suppressed within the cell, and allowing that to be replicated down further in the cell lines. So that's the idea of a persistent infection. Now this is not common to many viruses. It's pretty unique to a certain type of virus. Many of these are called retroviruses. Uh, examples include things like the herpes viruses, herpes simplex, which include herpes type 1 and 2, which call, uh, cause uh, cold sores and, and genital herpes, genital warts. Uh, this can also lead to uh, the um, herpes uh, zoster, sometimes called herpes varicella, which is the cause of chicken pox and shingles. And many people are aware of the connection, but if you're not, chicken pox can lead to a latent persistent infection that can later manifest as shingles. So shingles is basically your chickenpox virus re-emerging later in life in a virus that has been in your cells since you had chickenpox as a child. So a lot of a lot of people, depending on when you were born, may get a vaccine for for chickenpox. And, and the new mecha, mecha, the new um, protocol for chickenpox is to vaccinate prior to the virus, prior to getting it, and just avoid exposure altogether. It, previously, the the ideology, I guess that you might call it protocol, was to basically just let your kid get the chicken pox. And that's how it was for me and all my friends when I was young. Somebody had chicken pox and they were just, they'd say, oh, just let them get it and let them have it, let them get it out of the way now and, and go ahead and, and, you know, let their immune system build up tolerance to it. And, and the logic behind that was that if you get chicken pox as a kid, it's usually not a big deal. This is one of the few viruses that if you get it, as an adult, like in your 20s or 30s, it's usually much more serious. It's one of the few exa examples where it's actually kind of a reverse. Usually it's more damaging when you're young. In this case, it's actually more damaging when you're older. And I think it has to do with the rate of cell replication. Your cells replicate faster when you're younger. And in that particular case, that actually is beneficial to allow re re a replacement of some of the infected cells. Whereas you're, when you're older, the, the replacement of cells is, is slower and the virus does more damage. There's more to it than that, but that's kind of the general difference in this particular case. Again, not, not usually the case. But anyway, in this case, uh, if you get chicken pox as a kid, they now know that later this can manifest as shingles. So shingles is basically the persistent infection that you got as chicken pox that in some cases comes back out later in life as an adult. So that's an example of a persistent infection which is also sometimes referred to as a, a latent infection. Another example I showed is the HIV virus, and then even viruses like the cytomegalovirus, human cytomegalovirus, is another one here, also a herpes virus. So these are all kind of in the same general class called retroviruses. Retroviruses are essentially RNA viruses that convert themselves into DNA and then insert themselves into the host DNA, the host chromosomes. So this is somewhat unique to these types of viruses. So that's, that's kind of how some viruses go latent. One reason why you can get an infection early in life and have that infection manifest later in life as an adult. Now on this next slide, we're talking about another kind of consequence of this, which is how viruses can sometimes lead to cancer. In a nutshell, cancer results from alterations in your DNA. You have in your DNA specific information that codes for replication cycles of the normal cell, of the cell itself, I should say. So your cells have information that says when to replicate, how often to replicate, when to stop replicating, why you should replicate. Okay, so basically you have all this information that says when and how and, and, and for what reasons to replicate as a cell. Cancer basically is a is a mutation in that particular information that, that prevents the cell from going through the replication cycles normally. So normally a cell replicates and then stops replicating. With a cancer cell, it replicates but doesn't know when to stop replicating. And it just keeps replicating and keeps replicating and keeps replicating. 
and that is when you form a tumor. Uh, here's a figure. Uh, tumors can also be referred to as a neoplasm. Neoplasm is kind of the beginning stage of cancer when it's forming. And here you're seeing some of the cells growing, and rather than stopping, they just keep growing and keep growing and keep, keep growing and become a larger and larger mass. There's another figure showing the same thing. So normally these cells would grow until they became um, kind of uh, equally distributed, like in your tissue, they would stop growing once they start bumping into each other. They get these kind of feedback mechanisms that say, okay, there's too many of us, stop growing and we're good. In the cancer case, those, that, those feedback mechanisms are distorted, they're mutated, and they don't get the, the proper feedback. And they just keep replicating and keep replicating and keep replicating, and that's essentially what cancer is. And the difference between a benign cancer and a malignant cancer is whether this, the cancer cells get into the bloodstream. A benign cancer stays placed, stays in put, it only grows in one little location. A, a malignant cancer actually gets into your bloodstream and even the lymphatic system and spreads throughout the body and creates more tumors everywhere it goes. Here's another figure showing how cancer can get into the bloodstream and now it can basically travel all throughout the body causing little tumors everywhere it goes. That, that's the difference between a benign and a malignant cancer. But both are basically a distortion in the DNA that leads to inappropriate cell replication. So when it comes to viruses, viruses can distort your DNA. As we just showed, some viruses can insert themselves into your DNA. Every once in a while, when that happens, they cause a mutation in the DNA, and that mutation can sometimes lead to cancer. So anything that causes distortions in the DNA has a chance of causing cancer. And there's a certain probability depending on how much damage something is causing. Like smoking is a high probability because it causes lots of damage to your DNA. Uh, exposure to sunlight causes da damage to your DNA. And the more exposure, the more damage. So every little thing that causes damage has a, increases your probability of cancer. Uh, that's why many different chemicals cause cancer. But some are a low probability, some are high probability depending on how much damage they do. Viruses, once again, cause damage and therefore have the potential to cause cancer. And that's essentially what's happening here. So they, in this particular figure I pulled out of the textbook, they're saying up to 20% of human cancers are caused by viruses. That number could be different as of, as of now. This is, the textbook is always a couple years behind. Uh, my guess is it's probably higher than that, but I don't know that. I'm just totally speculating that. But um, my guess is there's probably more of that happening than what has been previously stated because uh, they're finding more and more examples of, of viruses that are, uh, have been previously uh, unrecognized. So viruses that do this are said to be oncogenic. Onco is a term that references cancer. O-N-C-O is, is a reference to cancer. So an, an oncologist, for example, is someone who studies cancer, cancer doctor. So oncogenic are viruses that can lead to cancer. The effect that they have is termed transformation. Transformation just refers to the overall changes that can, that can take place in a cell that has become cancerous. These include increased growth rates, the hallmark of cancer, alterations in chromosomes, changes in the cell surface molecules, and even the ability to, do, to divide infinitely. Uh, just to clarify that, one of the most fascinating things about cancer is that some cancer cells literally become immortal. Unlike normal cells that have a lifespan, they grow so many times and then they stop growing, which is what partly what leads to aging. Cancer cells unlock some sort of immortality. Not, not all of them, but some of them can actually continue to divide indefinitely, and they never actually die out, which is uh, kind of crazy because that's not normal. So you have an, ab an abnormation, aberration that actually leads to immortality in some cancer cells. So they're, they're studying that, trying to figure out why that is and how we might apply that to our normal cells, and that potentially could lead one day to a revolution in how, how to prevent aging, and they're actually making all sorts of progress on that. So, um, the, the viruses that, that cause these are called oncoviruses. I may, I may have misspoke there a little bit. Let me just say, there, there's kind of two words that say the same thing. They're, they're, they can, the effect is said to be oncogenic, uh, or to say the, um, really there's, there's really two ways of describing it. They're, they're calling them an oncogenic virus. In this case, we're calling them oncoviruses. It's kind of two ways of saying the same thing. So oh, the term I want you to know to clarify is oncoviruses. That's the term that describes a virus capable of causing cancer, oncoviruses.
oncogenic is kind of a different context of the word. So, if you recognize onco means cancer, then, then you'll be able to get that answer correct. Uh, examples include uh, a papilloma virus. Papilloma virus uh, is like similar to what causes HPV. The human papilloma virus causes damage and can lead to cancer. Uh, herpes viruses and the, even the hepatitis viruses, like hepatitis B and C, all have this ability to cause damage to DNA and cell that can potentially lead to a, a cancer effect. And as it says down here, the existence of these has created more speculation about other viruses that may be causing cancer. So like I said, the, the last figure said 20%. Um, it's probably higher than that, but, but you know, no one knows for sure, and those numbers can change on a dime depending on the way it's researched. So. Uh, last part here of the uh, animal viruses and the replication cycle, when it comes to treating viruses, the best form of defense against a virus is your immune system. Having a healthy, fully functioning immune system is your best bet to clearing a viral infection. Typically people who succumb to viral infection are those who are older and typically have a weakened immune system, and, and sometimes very young children who have a nasty viral infection can uh, also succumb if not getting proper treatment. So for the most part it involves your immune system. We'll talk about how this works when we get to chapter 14. Chapter 14 and even chapter 15 look at some of the mechanisms by which cells actually clear virally infected cells or actually how your immune system clears virally infected cells and how your body can repair itself in most cases in response to a viral infection. So more detail on that later. Um, now, one thing that you can do is you can take antiviral drugs. Antiviral drugs can be effective at slowing down a virus in, in stopping either parts of the replication cycle or just putting the brakes, so to speak, on the replication cycle. So for young children, for example, who may not have a fully formed immune system, these can be a nice way to slow the virus down and give the immune system a chance to catch up. This is also true for geriatric patients or just anybody, really. Uh, antivirals are good at slowing the virus down. Typically they're not going to stop a virus altogether unless you catch them very early in the replication cycle. So if you catch a virus very very early then it's possible to stop it mostly by taking antiviral. But really by the time you even think to take them some of the viruses are replicating and continuing their cycle. So ultimately it comes down to your immune system to fully clear the virus Antivirals are good at slowing it down and, and preventing the virus from outpacing your immune system. Remember I said earlier, it's kind of a chess match between the virus and your immune system. And it's kind of a game of who wins, who, who's faster essentially, and, and usually it's the immune system. But in some cases, the virus has a leg up and the antivirals will kind of knock it down a couple notches and allow your immune system to overcome. This can be the difference in people with a low immune system. And for people who are healthy, this is sometimes just a way to not be sick as long or prevent the full effect of a viral infection from taking place. So if you take something like Tamiflu, for example, Tamiflu is one of the more common antiviral medications. If you take that early during the course of an infection, like when you first start getting sick, you think, oh, I'm, I'm starting to get sick. Uh, you take Tamiflu, if it's actually a viral infection, then you might not get nearly as sick. You might prevent the worst symptoms from happening and you may only have a day of, of illness and, and then followed by a quicker recovery. So for people who would otherwise fight off the virus anyway and probably wouldn't succumb to it, the antivirals can, can just make you so that you don't get sick as intensely or as long. Uh, but otherwise, it's really up to your immune system. The immune system is, is the mechanism by which you actually rid the body of the virus. The antivirals simply slow it down. And unless you take these, unless you just take antivirals at the first sign of infection, or at first I should say the first sign of exposure, um, and just completely stop the virus from getting into your body altogether, uh, then unless that happens, then your, your immune system is necessary uh, to fight it off. I will say somewhat anecdotally though, I took this, I had just one kind of experience with it. This is totally anecdotal, not medical advice, just my experience. Um, I have a brother who was out in Colorado. I was on the, literally on the way out to see him driving, 10 hour drive. He calls me halfway and says, hey, by the way, everybody here is sick. He's got a wife and two kids, everybody's sick. And just so you know, basically you're driving out into a, a sick ward, on, uh, FYI. 
And then, okay. So I went ahead and stopped at Walgreens and picked up some Zyrtec. Had never tried it before. And uh, we took it religiously. It says to take it every four hours while you think you're being exposed. So basically, if you think you're in an area where you might get sick from a virus, someone's sick around you, maybe you work in a hospital where everybody's hacking up a lung, take this every so many, every four hours. And what it does is it actually blocks the virus from attaching to your cells. It actually blocks the absorption stage, supposedly, and prevents the virus from getting inside your body. And uh, I tell you, again, totally anecdotally, it worked like a charm. I was literally being coughed on. I might as well have been injecting the virus into my bloodstream and didn't get sick. And, and it was that's one of the first times I can think that, that I've been that heavily exposed without any actual infection. So totally anecdotal, but I would highly recommend that if you're ever in that situation. It was about 15 bucks, and it was worth every penny. I would have paid three times that at least uh, because it prevented me from getting sick, and that was a lifesaver. So it's another way. It's kind of like antiviral. In that case, you have to take it early and often, and it basically stops the virus from actually getting into your cells, allegedly. That's what they say. So it appears to work. Again, I didn't have a lot of experience with it, but I would at least recommend it and give it a try. I've heard that from other students when I mentioned that. I hear a lot of positive feedback from other people who've had a similar experience. Okay. Next, we're going to talk about viruses that infect bacteria. So back in chapter six, part one, early on, early on, I mentioned that viruses can infect every type of living organism on Earth. Everything is subject to some kind of viral infection. So there are animal viruses, there are plant viruses, and even there are bacterial viruses, and many more. But um, being a microbiology class, one of the major topics is to talk about what are called bacteriophages. These are viruses that infect bacteria. So the name is in reference to uh, the viruses that infect bacteria. Sometimes they call them phage for short, uh, but that's uh, in reference to a bacterial phage. I remember learning about these when I took micro, and I just remember looking at a figure just like this and thinking, there's no way that's real. Like, that can't be a real thing. But it is. That, that, this is a, a drawing here, obviously. This is a real picture of a bacterial phage, uh, of the high resolution microscope image. And I've got more. Let me just pull one up on the web here. Here's some other pictures of a bacteriophage. This is, let's see, here's a real picture. That's a, not the best quality, but that's a high resolution microscope image. It got a little bit distorted. Um, here's one that very similar to what you were just looking at there. Uh, another one here. Um, this is a high resolution image that's been artificially colored. It's a pretty good one. Shows the bacteriophage there. I think that one's been manipulated to kind of reorientate though, but those are real images there. Um, some of the, a lot of these are computer animation. That's an animation or illustration. This, I believe, is a real one. I could be wrong. I'm pretty sure that's an actual image there. So, anyway, these are real things. Here's another real image showing lots of bacteriophages attached. So, hard to believe. I know I was very, very skeptical when I first saw that, but. Believe it or not, that's a real thing. It looks like a right out of a science fiction movie, like a spaceship. What you're looking at is a what's called a complex virus. It's got a, a, a capsid here, uh, capsid head that has a, the icosahedral capsid, but it's considered complex because it has all these extra features down here: the tail fibers, the collar, and the sheath. These are all part of the complexity of this shape here. Now, bacteriophages work in a similar way that animal viruses do and that they have to have lock and key specificity with their host. The virus has to attach to the receptors on the host cell in order to infect. In this case, the, the tail fibers act as the spikes which attach to the receptors on the bacterial cell. Uh, just like animal viruses, there's a certain range of specificity here. Some have broad specificity, some have intermediate, some have restricted. Uh, the difference is they all infect bacteria, so they're always always specific to some kind of bacteria, but within the different range of types of bacteria, some are broad, intermediate, and restricted. Now they have a very similar stage, or excuse me, a very similar replication cycle as animal viruses do, and that is they absorb, they penetrate. One difference is that they actually don't have an encoding stage. So let me come right back to that. So they absorb, they penetrate, that skips encoding, goes directly into synthesis, followed by assembly. And for some reason, I left off one on here. I want you to add to that. They also then release. 
as the final stage. So go ahead and add that there. Uh, assembly is followed by release, just like in the animal viruses. And if you back up, you can look back at the different release mechanisms. Vi bacteriophages always release through lysis, popping of the cell membrane. So you can add that as well. So release, which is uh, lysis of the cell. So absorption, again, spe specific to the host, lock and key. They have to match a certain host cells in order to, in order to be able to attach a necessary prerequisite for infection. Penetration, in this case, is different from an animal virus. Bacteriophages are like a little syringe. And you can see here in this figure, when they attach, they literally inject the DNA directly across the cell envelope. So across the outer membrane, if it's gram negative, across the cell wall, and across the cell membrane, and just like a syringe injecting something into your body, it's kind of how a bacteriophage works. And what that does is it just directly injects the DNA or RNA uh, in a naked form, and there's no need for uncoating. So the one difference is it skips the uncoating stage. After that, though, the synthesis, the assembly, and release are very similar uh, as to an animal type virus. Now, one difference here, this is figure 6.19 out of your text. There are essentially two different types of bacteriophages. And they essentially go through two different life cycles. And um, these are in reference to kind of how they might go dormant. So some bacteriophages have the ability to go dormant, like we mentioned earlier with the animal viruses, like uh, those that become a provirus and insert themselves into the host DNA. So back up and look at that if you, if you skipped over that. So there's essentially uh, two cycles that these bacteriophages can go through. Let me skip ahead and come right back to this. Um, these bacteriophages, let me skip ahead one more time here. Whoops, sorry, one more. Uh, oh, here it is, excuse me. Uh, the word I was looking for was called a temperate phage, a temperate bacteriophage. A temperate bacteriophage, here it says right here, uh, these, are, these are bacteriophages that can go dormant in the host cell. Okay, So you have essentially bacteriophages that release them, that, that replicate continuously. In other words, they enter, they synthesize, they assemble, they release all in kind of one swoop. And uh, that's just considered a normal bacteriophage. Contrary to that, you have what's called a temperate bacteriophage or a temperate phage. These are bacteriophages that penetrate and go dormant and then can release at a later stage. So they don't essentially replicate uh, all in one swoop. They kind of break up that cycle and have periods of dormancy. Okay, so the difference is represented by two different cycles. The normal is called the lytic cycle, and this is showing here where they, they absorb, they penetrate, they go through the synthesis and assembly, and then release immediately, kind of all in one process, in one kind of short time frame. The alternative to that is where the, the temperate bacteriophages, what they do is they absorb, penetrate, but then they go into a dormant state, and in this case what's happening is the viral DNA is inserted into the bacterial chromosome, sometimes into the bacterial plasmid. So here it's showing uh, where the, the pink is showing the, the bacterial chromosome and the blue is showing the, the viral DNA. And what it's showing is that the viral DNA integrates into uh, the, um, the host DNA molecule. So it's a lot like we talked about with the provirus. It's really the same thing in a slightly different context. So, this is called the lysogenic state, when the DNA enters, in, integrates into the, the DNA of the bacterial cell. And now, this can basically be a dormancy that can be uh, variable time periods. Sometimes it can be a short period of time. Sometimes it can actually be indefinitely. So it can be anywhere from a matter of hours to it never actually leaves that stage. But a lot of times there'll be maybe a matter of days or uh, in a lot of cases what happens is the bacteria will replicate the viral information and pass that on to future bacterial cells and then the virus will pop up later in a future generation. So it's kind of this odd thing that they do to incorporate themselves either semi-permanently or uh, actually permanently into the viral DNA. And that's what's called the lysogenic state. So it's a deviation from the lytic cycle in which they go dormant. 
They call this the lytic cycle, by the way, in reference to the word lysis, which means to pop and, and rupture open, which is what you see at the end of the lytic cycle. So they call it that because it ends with lysis of the cell. So lysogenic is in reference to the dormancy that they go into. So that again involves temperate bacteriophages. They become dormant. In this case, it's the, the dormant information in the cell is called a prophage. So prophage is similar to provirus. It's, this is in reference to the fact that it's a phage, the, a phage virus as opposed to any other kind of virus. And so they call it a prophage. It's basically the bacteriophage DNA inserted into the chromosome and uh, is, is then uh, integrated into that the bacterial DNA. So the term, a few more terms here, lysogeny. I know these terms get confusing, okay? This is where you just gotta sit down and commit these to memory. A lot of terminology and biology is confusing as you already know. So lysogeny is the term that applies to the condition in which the, the bacteriophage DNA is integrated, uh, or excuse me, it, the condition in which the bacteria is carrying the bacteriophage DNA. So lysogeny is the condition in which the bacterial chromosome carries the bacteriophage DNA. The term prophage is in reference to the actual DNA of the bacteriophage itself. So we're kind of talking about the same thing under a slightly different context. Lysogeny, bacteria carries prophage DNA. Uh, prophage is the actual DNA itself. Hopefully that makes sense. Induction occurs when the prophage DNA is released from the cell, or excuse me, when the, the virus is released from the cell. So induction occurs when the uh, prophage comes out of dormancy and continues the cycle. So if we go back here, essentially you can see the bacteria phage can go dormant in a lysogenic state, and then at some point that, that DNA can be further synthesized and lead back into synthesis, assembly, and then release. So essentially you've got the lytic cycle here taking place like a backwards clock. It can go off into this side state over here in the lysogenic state, and then for various reasons, induction occurs and it goes back into the lysogenic state. And that's what we call induction. Lysogeny is a scenario where it actually benefits the virus because it doesn't immediately affect the cell and it actually gives the, the virus more time to replicate itself and to pass on that, that viral genetic information to other bacteria. This is actually part of the context of how viruses evolve over time. The best viruses are those that actually are the least harmful to the host cell. The, the most virulent, we call them, uh, virulent, damaging, uh, harmful viruses, those are actually the least successful over time because you need a host cell to replicate. As a virus, the ideal scenario is that the host cell has no clue that you're there and that you do no damage and the host cell allows the virus to stay long term. That's really kind of the ideal scenario for the virus itself. When a virus causes lots of damage really fast, it literally kills the very host cell that it needs uh, to survive. Now, of course, they can go on to infect more host cells, but generally uh, that's less advantageous. So lysogeny is, is this scenario where viruses have kind of evolved to be less impactful and at the very least delay the impact to give them more time to replicate. So when a virus goes into the lysogenic cycle, what can actually happen is the, the bacteria will make copies of itself and pass that virus on to future generations. So let me just draw this real quick to give you the visual. Here's your bacteria. Here's the, the phage DNA, phage DNA being shown here, oops, colors, being shown here in red. Phage DNA enters and becomes part of the bacterial chromosome. Now, what happens is as this bacteria replicates, it makes copies of itself. The copies also have the phage DNA. And as they make copies, they have the phage DNA. And now the bacteriophage is being passed along in more and more cells. Every time this bacteria replicates, another copy of the phage DNA is made, and this bacteriophage becomes more and more common in the population. Now at some point, induction can occur, and the virus can go back out of the dormancy and pop back up. And at that point, you now have 
dozens and or you know even more. In this show, this small example, we've got a dozen or so here that now can all release, and and now you've got you know ten times more of the viral information that you had prior. If the if the virus had replicated immediately and caused death of the first cell that it infected, then none of those other cells would have had a chance to spawn and the virus would have had a much shorter run at replicating. Okay, so I'm kind of generalizing, but that's kind of the idea. If you infect immediately and you kill the cell, that kind of squashes your chance to pass on your genetic information to more and more cells. So lysogeny is a condition in which the viruses have kind of evolved to be less harmful in order to increase their set success and in, in spread. Last little bit here, one of the interesting side effects of lysogeny in which bacteriophages go dormant in the DNA is kind of like we mentioned, some viruses can cause cancer by mutating the DNA. In bacteria, like bacteriophages can also cause mutations. And every once in a while, these mutations have actually been shown and proven to make some of these bacteria more pathogenic. So essentially, lysogeny can mutate the bacteria, causing changes. And every once in a while, that change actually makes the bacteria more harmful. So the infection by a virus changes the characteristic and can make the bacteria more harmful. It can certainly do other things, but this is when we tend to take notice. As, as scientists, as, as people studying this, we tend to focus on what are the impacts to human health, and this is one of the, the areas that they're looking at here. So lots of other changes could happen, but one of interest is the fact that they cause a mutation that leads to the production of a toxin or an enzyme that is pathogenic to humans, or it can make something even worse, more pathogenic than it was previously. And the idea, this is called lysogenic conversion. This is when a bacterium acquires a new trait from a, from a temperate bacteriophage during that lysogenic cycle. Uh, a few examples that the textbook mentions, uh, Cornybacterium diphtheriae, this is the causative, causative agent of diphtheria uh, in, induced by a, a temperate phage. Uh, Vibrio cholerae, this is the agent that causes cholera, a waterborne illness that infects many third world countries. And even Clostridium botulinum, the causative agent of botulism. Botulism is a, uh, a spore forming, or Clostridium botulinum is a spore forming bacteria that leads to a toxin called the botulinum toxin. Also, by the way, what they inject into your face when you get Botox. You can look that up. Uh, Botox involves injection of a bacterial toxin into your face or any other part of your body that paralyzes the muscles and the nerves that makes your face go flat. Interesting stuff. Last little bit, prions are not a virus but mentioned here because they are also a non-living infectious particle. So chapter six is mostly about the viruses but in the end it talks about uh, another type of non-living infectious particle, which is how we defined a virus in chapter 6, part 1, and that is, is called a prion. Prions are very interesting. They are uh, very rare, but very, very deadly. So luckily they're rare, because when, when someone picks them up, they are very lethal. And uh, what happens with a prion is a prion is basically a, a protein molecule that distorts other proteins around it. Let me find a figure here just real quick. Okay, so this is showing a type of prion. I give them a name. It's called PRPC, and this is is basically a. Um, uh, excuse me, this is a normal protein. Excuse me, so a normal protein called PRPC. It interacts with a prion shown here as this little spiky red one, and called the PRPSC. Don't worry about the acronyms. I'm not going to test you on that. But what happens here is that you basically have a normal protein that interacts with a prion, which is basically just a infectious protein. What ends up happening is the interaction between a normal protein and the infectious protein is that the infectious protein converts the normal protein into another infectious protein. So you basically have a protein that converts normal proteins into infectious proteins. It's almost like it's almost like zombies. How you know a zombie bites someone and then they become a zombie and then they go bite someone else and they become a zombie. And yes, I'm talking about zombies. That is kind of like how a prion works. You have a, a, a infectious molecule that basically converts other molecules into that infectious form. And then now you have two infectious molecules. And then they go on to infect other normal proteins and convert them to infectious proteins. Now the real issue here is that the infectious protein 
doesn't function like the normal protein. So there's lots of information here. I'm kind of skipping over lots of detail. But in a sense, what happens here is that these proteins affect the nervous tissue. So you have normal proteins in your nerve cells that are doing their normal function, that conduct normal nerve cell activity. Prions are a distorted version of these proteins in the nervous system. And they basically convert normal proteins into non-functional infectious proteins. So when you're exposed to one of these prions, what happens is they slowly convert normal proteins into more infectious prions, which not only stop working and shut down the normal nerve cell function, but then go on to affect more proteins and slowly cause more dysfunction of your nervous system. So you have really two things happening. Normal proteins being, uh, being shut down, they stop functioning, and then a higher rate of conversion of more normal proteins into more non-functional proteins. I mean, the zombie analogy kind of works here because it's, a, it's essentially uh, one infectious thing infecting more, which then go on to infect more and more and more. So hopefully that makes sense. That's kind of the idea behind a prion. Um, there are two common types. Or there's really actually quite a few. Prions are, are not species specific. They can be theoretically passed between any two animals, and, uh, and that's one of the dangers of them. Uh, the disease they cause is called spongiform encephalopathy. Spongiform encephalopathy basically is a medical term that references holes in the brain. Encephalopathy is the a disease of the brain. Uh, spongiform is in reference to sponge-like tissue or holes, uh, kind of like a sponge. So here you're looking at four brain tissues brain tissue samples. Up here in the top left is normal, nice and smooth. Down here is a human condition called CJD, quartzfeld jakobs disease. And you can see here there are little holes that kind of look like a sponge, I guess. That's how they reference it. And these here are two other diseases. Uh, Kubaru, which is actually uh, picked up in certain tribes due to cannibalism. Uh, eating brain tissue is actually one way that you can actually pick this up super rare, but that's kind of where it originated, actually. And then scrappy is a form that's been seen in uh, sheep and goats and things like that. So they all kind of lead to the same thing, which is holes in the brain. There are different names for different contexts of the disease. kreutzfeldt jakob disease is one of the more common. This is what affects humans and uh, is uh, basically a death sentence. And it's uh, something that when this one gets it, there's no cure for it, and it eventually causes uh, a slow progressive degeneration of the nervous system and is a, a very unfortunate disease to be diagnosed, those diagnosed with. Luckily, it is very, very rare. Uh, another form of that is what people have maybe heard of before called bovine spongiform encephalopathy. And if you don't have any clue which, what that is, uh, it's actually a more technical term for mad cow disease. So mad cow disease was actually a prion disease that you may have heard of. People were talking about this over 10 years ago uh, to a large degree. Uh, mad cow disease was something that started uh, in the United Kingdom due to really, really shoddy practices. They were actually feeding cows that were infected to other cows. They would have a, a diseased cow that they couldn't sell to, for human consumption because it was diseased. But there was no law at the time that said that you couldn't grind up that cow and feed it to other cows as a protein source. Yes, they were literally taking diseased cows and feeding them to other cows as a way to save money in, in, uh, because the cow had value to it and they didn't want to just throw it away. So they, they ground it up and fed it to the other cows to save money on protein. Yes. And what that did was it basically infected thousands of cows. They went from this being a rare disease, super rare, hardly ever happens, maybe one in a thousand, maybe one in 10,000. I'm not sure the exact numbers, but it's very rare. I know that. And so very rare, they had probably one cow at some point that was diseased, should have been just, you know, the body should have been disposed of and, and nothing should have been done with it except for probably incineration. And instead they ground it up and literally fed it to the other cows to save money on protein. Unbelievable. And what that did was it affected thousands more cows. And within a short period of time, the, the meat supply in the United Kingdom became tainted with prion and people were eating it and getting sick and several hundred people died from this terrible disease because of an absolutely ridiculous practice of feeding sick cows to other cows. Unbelievable. But that's how that happened. 
And uh, that's why the mad cow outbreak took place in the late, it was like the late 90s, early 2000s, somewhere in that time period. Uh, since then, they've cleaned up that practice. They basically had to say, no, you can't do that. You can't sell, you can't feed sick cows to other cows. And uh, they've also eliminated the sale for the most part of cow brain, cow eyes, and cow spinal cord. Now, from my understanding, you can still buy those in certain places, but um, you probably won't. I've never seen them at the supermarket. I think you have to get them from non conventional sources, let's just say. Uh, but generally speaking, it's probably not a good idea to eat cow brain, cow eyes, or cow uh, spinal cord because that is actually where the prions come from. So if you're just eating the tissue like steak or hamburger, prions are not in that part of the cow. They stay resigned in the nervous system, uh, in the central nervous system, in the eyes, the brain, and the spinal cord. This is also true for any other form of the disease. So if you're eating something that has it, then theoretically you can't get it if you get it, if you eat just the tissue and not the ner central nervous system. So uh, one of the problems is they were grinding all this up and creating this meat concoction, uh, kind of hot dogs, which is just a ground up concoction of all sorts of things. So, um, you know, they had to stop selling those parts of the cow as well as stop allowing people to feed infected cows to other cows. And that really has led to almost a complete elimination from that in the food supply. So mad cow isn't something that really you should worry about anymore. Quartzville shock up disease. I'll stop it here. I don't want to keep going on this, but uh, look that one up. It's very interesting. That's the human form of the disease. It's actually genetic and it can actually be transmitted uh, through rare occurrences of like um, any sort of um, fluid exchange that involves the central nervous system, which is not very common. So, anyway, that's the last little bit here. Um, as always, email me with any questions. Let me know if anything needs to be re-explained, and I'd be happy to bring it up in class. Have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.